As soon as we have more information as to what actually caused this, and of course, on everybody's mind, who was yeah. might have been hurt as a result of, the, of this terrible, terrible incident. And on that day, I could not have been prouder to have been part of this show. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. What Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Today show's newest fan. A little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? Oh, oh, yeah. This is your moment. Your moment. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Since President Harry Truman, the Today Show has been holding politicians' feet to the fire. Over the years, politicians have loved to come to the Today Show because we do have that collegiality and it's a great audience and, and politicians want to reach that audience. But if they come to the Today Show, they can expect a hard question. Well, let's talk about that third person, Ross Perot. I told you I was gonna be here for 30 seconds. Well, I know, but aren't Barbara. I great? I'm one of these less contentious reporters who can convince yeah, you to stick around and talk with me. Yeah. And sometimes maybe harder than they anticipated. I hear a lot that you are sometimes slow to react. Are you the leader of the opposition in exile right now in the Republican Party? Do you get how bad it looks? I have the transcript of the call. Do you think this was a perfect call? Yeah. Have you known that he's, he is a liar, as you say? Well, absolutely. He Why tells... did you work for him? Savannah, slow down. And when I think about what to ask, I'm thinking about what people at home are wondering. I'm thinking about the question that maybe the politician doesn't want to answer, but people at home really want to know. And I think that's our role. You know, I interviewed President Obama at the White House. If this resolution fails in Congress, would you act without Congress? The, the answer could be yes, no, or I haven't decided. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that I haven't decided. Welcome, Mr. President, and thank you for being that here. That was very well stated, I have to say. I did the town hall with President Trump just weeks before the election. So the stakes were really high. We were in the middle of a pandemic and the election was weeks away and it was controversial. That was a retweet. People can decide for themselves. That. I don't the take president. a position. You're not like someone's crazy uncle who no, can no, just retweet no, no. whatever. That was a retweet. I have a pretty little colon. That's it? We were up to the top, mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Yeah. I'll stay up there a little longer. I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding. The Today Show has a long history of sparking conversations about subjects people usually don't like to talk about and almost never on TV. We lost Frank. I want to thank everybody for your love. I'll tell you when I realized the possibilities of the platform. A couple years ago, my, uh, my older brother was, was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer, late, late stage, and, and uh, I went to the powers that be and I said, you know, I, I think we can, we can do some good here. And we profiled him and his treatment and his doctor and, and just colon cancer in, in general. We, we decided to, to shine a light on it. And he ultimately, you know, he, he didn't make it, he died. And during the course of that, during the course of the coverage, because we did a number of follow-up stories as well on colon cancer, not an exaggeration, hundreds of people, I, I heard from them, whether it's email or on the streets or on the plaza, they would say, hey, I got screened because I saw your story on your brother, or, or I, I, I made my, my husband get screened, or 
I called my doctor because something went right and I saw your story and I started asking about family history. That's when I realized. Cleveland Cavaliers forward Kevin Love details his bout with a very public panic attack. I was uh, diagnosed with GAD, general anxiety disorder, and mild panic, very similar to what Kevin Love was talking about there. And during the piece, as he was describing his panic attack, I was saying to Craig Melvin, my colleague, oh my God, this has happened to me a million times. And he was like, what, really? He's like, can I ask you about that? And so when we came out of the piece, I first started sharing that I was had been diagnosed for GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, and, and panic attacks. You feel like you're dying. In fact, I went to the hospital, and the first thing you put it on, I got leads on my chest. I'm like, my heart's going to stop, or I'm gonna have a heart attack. And of course, what happens is you're perfectly fine. From that moment on, it's become something that I've really tried to take ownership of here at the Today Show and NBC News to cre help create that conversation on mental health and help break the stigma of talking about mental health and bringing the stats to life. And you know, I'm somebody that has suffered in silence and there's so many millions of us that do. And I'm really proud of that, the part that I've you know, been able to just kind of share what's worked for me and my struggles. And in turn, it's hopefully helped other people share their story. And that's really what's so important with mental health is to get that conversation going. I do have something to tell you. That little girl, Haley Joy. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm She's crying. Um, is my daughter. No! Yay! Wow! Congratulations! Oh my gosh! I adopted her. And I think no matter what the experience is, whether it's breast cancer or adoption or, you know, getting engaged later in life, whatever it is, I feel like sometimes if, if I get hope from people who do things um, that I feel like are, are difficult at the time. And so I'm, you know, I don't know what I'm providing except for just, you know, kind of telling my business. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd Cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. In the City of Angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Some of my favorite moments on the Today Show had me going places I never really thought I would see, or not, not the way I got to see them through the show. I got to go visit the Holy Land. And when we walk through these doors, we're going to see Calvary. On the way, we're going to see Calvary itself. Calvary is where Jesus was crucified, now located inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I knew, I, I always wanted to visit Israel, to go with the Today Show and have access to the places, the wisdom of experts. It was a phenomenal professional experience, but it was also a deeply personal and spiritual experience. And good morning from the Sydney Opera House in Sydney, Australia. We I went to Australia, which actually is the place I was born. 
but I had no memory of it. And all my life, Australia ha held this kind of mystical quality, this other land. And not only did I get to visit the house where I lived when I was a newborn baby, we found the hospital where I was born, we found the room where I was born, and they even found the midwives from that era who basically delivered me. This is the room that you took your first breath in. <gasps> oh my god! How does that oh feel? My I think seeing the very place you were born is not something most people get to do or That's see. True. To get to go back with my mom, this is really special, special time. Amazingly awesome. And to top it all off, to be in the place where it all began for us, <laughs> to be in the room where it all began for us is a memory I will treasure. Love you. We love you. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The United States Which is he superhuman? Feel the magic every day. She is a superstar. Yeah. Kayla, we are cheering <laughs> you are. on. And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today, today, today. Today, today is where the games begin. Good morning, the United Shutdown of America. Look, the pandemic, we were, we were just like everybody else. We were working from home or we were living at work. I can't figure out which one it was, but we were separated from each other. And you don't realize how much you feed off of each other. It's a little funky looking at this three box, but I'm happy to be sitting in between you guys. I think what connected us was this common mission, this feeling that these are serious times. People are terrified. We have the opportunity to ask the questions of these doctors and experts and public health officials. Joining us now from Washington, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. <sighs> Look who it is! That's it! Go! Slow-mo <laughs> run shot! Are we allowed to hug? It's Al Roker! Oh, yes! Yes. Also, when we got back together and we got to see each other again for the first time, when we got to sit next to each other for the first time, when we got to hug each other, we'll never take that for granted again. I didn't fully appreciate how much we were a part of people's lives during the pandemic until folks started returning to the plaza. And you would get like teachers and nurses especially who would say, Craig, thank you. Thank you for helping us get through the pandemic. And I was like, and at first I was like, what do you mean? You mean like the, the doctors who would, no, no, no. Like, it was heavy, it was hard. And we would turn on the Today Show in the morning because we knew we'd get the information that we needed. But we also knew that we would laugh and we would smile with you guys. Today Show viewers come here every single day to propose, to, to wave to friends and family, to hold up signs, to share messages, to be with us. Um, and that is a huge, huge part of the recipe of success for the show for 70 years. Like we can't do this without the people who come down here to the plaza and our viewers nationwide. The show really first got going. It was in a window on that same side of the street on 49th Street, and and everybody would stop by. It was it was it was like we had taken 
the, the beauty and the majesty and the mystery of television. Because if you gotta remember, again, back at that time, people would literally stand in front of appliance stores and watch TV through the glass. Well now, they could come and watch TV through the glass and the TV was watching them. Well, what part of our cast is you, uh, you the public at least. See, we're in a big glassed-in kind of fishbowl here. We can look out the window, as you see, and see the people who are looking in at us anytime. And we see all sorts of fascinating folks from home out there, and sometimes they stand out there and look at us and wave at the folks back home. Here we are, TikTok, the interweb, the tweeter, all that stuff. But you know what? People still like to be seen on TV to the folks back home. There's the beauty of it. In 1952, people were waving and the TV camera was panning them. And here we are in the 21st century and people are still waving and holding up signs and hoping that somebody back home sees them. How great is that? The audience is the heart of this show, whether they're at home or whether they're in our plaza or whether they're peeking through our window. The audience is the beating heart of this show. It's literally why we get up in the morning. People have made the Today Show part of their mornings and part of their lives and part of their families for decades. You'll meet people who say, my grandma watched the Today Show, my mom watched the Today Show, now I watch the Today Show, my kids watch it with me. People who watch the Today Show feel like their family and guess what? We feel like your family too. I've always felt like an audience member because that's what I feel feel like I am a lot of the time. Like when I walk out, I think I would be doing that. I would be coming to 30 Rock. I'd hold up a sign. I know my mom would. She'd be out there with a sign. So I think when you look out and you see like bright shining faces of, of people who've waited, you know, for this magical moment, it's so um, like incredibly satisfying and beautiful to share in it. Like, that's what I feel like when I walk out. I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to find out, like, who's here. So what, bring, what brings you to the Today Show? Well, I mean, this, we've always wanted to do this, and um, Today Show is a part of our life. We've been watching it every day for seven years when we met, so, yeah. so from a boat. Yeah. <laughs> Super fans. <laughs> My name is well, good morning, Barbara. Hi. Barbara Walters, the Jane Paulies, the Katies, the Meredith, they blew the doors open, and then me and Savannah just strolled through. We're like, hey, thanks. We are kicking off the year right because Hoda is officially the co-anchor of today. Oh. Hoda, you are a partner and a friend and a sister, and I am so happy to be doing this. Well, there's no one I'd rather be sitting next to in 2018. A woman stopped me with her child, and she said, thank you, because now my daughter thinks this is totally normal. To me, the Today Show is the gold standard. The producers, the crew, the staff, everyone who puts this show together, far more than the people you see on TV, they are the best of the best, and they pour themselves into it every day and every night. People tune in because they know what they're going to see is reliable, it's accurate, it's well-produced, it's curated, it's important. We won't waste your time. And I think that's why the show continues to be relevant. It's that, and then it's also that hopefully people feel a connection and feel a bond with the people on set who are sharing the news with them. I mean, in a way, I, I, I feel like it, it's different than some anchorman voice of God telling you what's going on in the world. I feel like we are coming on together and we are informing, but also processing the news with our viewers. And there's a connection there. And to me, that has stood the test of time and is what will continue to stand the test of time. People have tuned in and the people who brought them that news will have changed. But the mission has it, to find out that the world is still there and get them ready for their day. Here's the thing about life, okay, for all of us. Every single working environment, family, group has days that it's bright and shiny and there's nothing better. And we also have days when we're on our knees. And that's the way life goes. That's the way it goes. And you just ride the waves, and I feel like that's how you have to navigate just life in general. And we navigated at work. 
Some days are the best day ever, and some days you wonder, like, what in the heck's going on? But no matter what, you adjust your sales and you go, because we got a long road. We're only 70? I mean, like, we're babies, you know, goo goo. We got a long way to go. I think Dave Garraway and everyone that started this little project in black and white would be astonished and amazed, and I hope they'd be proud. Thank you. Goodbye until tomorrow morning. Peace. First of all, I just want to comment that when you came rocking up here with your braids, I was in my head applauding because I remember the story. Yes. You were at AT&T. It was one of your first big jobs. You had braids. Like, what did they tell you? Yes. They told me that my braids and my red shoes were unprofessional. Oh. And I mean, they meant it. And they were trying to help. I mean, that's the part that, that's the irony of it all. They're really trying to help me. And they said, you have to get rid of that. So I went home and my mom and my oldest sister, Cassandra, stayed up all night with me taking my braids out. Because you wanted to fit. Oh, I wanted to fit. You've been breaking the mold for most of your life. Yes. Uh, you've been someone who just makes your way through. But I want to go way, way back. Okay. Because I think we're all shaped from when we're little kids. Yes. And when you were a little kid, you were scared. Yes. I was scared. I was scared. Domestic violence uh, was part of our, uh, part of our family. Where did you put that part of your life when you were a little girl? Uh, you know, we hid it. I mean, people didn't know that my mom was a, you know, a victim of domestic violence. They didn't know my dad was doing the things he was doing. And so we just hid it, just like they hid it, mm -hmm. uh, until it just got to a point where my mom decided she wasn't going to deal with it anymore. As a little girl, how did you feel when you couldn't protect her? It was tough. And there were six of us. I mean, so we'd get in each other's rooms or, you know, we'd sit on the couch and we'd hear things. And it, it got to a point where my brother was uh, getting ready to graduate from high school and I was 15. It got to the point where we had to call the police uh, hmm. because it was graduation day and um, he just went crazy. And we called the police and they came and got us. My mom says we have to go to the graduation. So we still did that. And then we went to Cassandra's house and stayed the whole summer. And that was it. Did he think that you could ever become somebody? No, and that was the painful part. He told my youngest sister and I that summer that we would be hookers on the street without him. Mm. And that was so painful. I mean, it was so painful, but there were years where I would think about that every single day mm. that he actually said that. Mm. And that's when my younger sister cried, I cried, and I don't know where it came from. I was 15 years old. And she said, is that true? I said, that's not true. Hmm. Because I guess I just dug into like everything my mom had taught us, that we are not gonna be hookers on the street. I said, I'm gonna be the president of something one day. Now, this optimism, this, you have, I know who's on your side. Yes. God's on your side. Yes. And your mom has placed that on your heart since you were a little girl. Yes. Math book in this hand, Bible in this hand. Yeah. So did you always feel protected somehow? that God was gonna watch out for you no yes. matter how bad things got. Yes, I always felt that. I mean, I always felt that. And my mom used to like take all six of us to church and we'd walk to church. And she'd walk us up Cutting Boulevard and then 23rd Street and she'd give us scriptures. The 23rd Psalm, she'd give us scriptures about protection. And so I just always felt that God was gonna protect me, but I always felt that other people huh. would protect me too. So I always felt like somebody was going to show up. So here you are, you told your sister, we're gonna be somebody, we're gonna go to college. We're yes. gonna, so you get into, where, where'd, you go to, where'd you go to college? The number one public institution in the world. It. The University of California at Berkeley. Yes, yes, yes. And not because it's such a great school, but because it was 15 minutes away from home. Yeah, so you were at Berkeley, you were the first black cheerleader. Yes. You were the first black member of a sorority. Uh, DG. Yes. Uh -huh. Anchors away. <laughs> Anchors away. <laughs> did you set out to be the first or did you just do what you did? No, I just do what I did. And I think that happens a lot. Like, you don't know you're the first. I was a cheerleader in high school. So I said, okay, I'm going to be a cheerleader in college. And I went out for the first time and did not make it. 
and said, well, that happened to me in high school too. And so I went out and I made it. And then, of course, uh, being in my sorority, I went through Rush and I ended up being a DG. And I didn't know that I was going to, be, that I was the only black girl in the house. Yeah. Until I got there, yeah. as me and 110 of my white and Asian friends, it's like, <laughs> okay, great. And you know, everybody feeling another afro and all that. It was a great experience, a great, but you don't know your first, you're just doing. Right. I was just doing what I was supposed to. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year gonna look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. So AT&T, um, were you married when you went to AT&T? No, no. No, I had this whole plan that I was going to graduate from college. You know, once I put my boyfriend on hold for four years, literally four years, once I put him on hold, then picked it back up, I said, okay, so I'll, I'll get married two years, I'm going to work for two years, then I'm going to have, you know, start a family. So I had it kind of all mapped out. I would have thought that you had all the tough stuff in your life early, but I w if, if I were God, I would say, Sint does not deserve any more tough stuff right. after what she's been through. But life is funny like that. <laughs> yes, it is. It doesn't give you all the goodness later. The no. bad stuff still comes. You and your right. husband really did want to start a family, didn't we did. you? We did. And that was not to be early, was it? No. Four second trimester miscarriages mm. in 10 years of trying to have kids. Mm. Four. We never could quite figure it out. And then when we got pregnant the fifth time, I said, OK, this is the fifth and final time. This is it. And we just thought there was either another miscarriage coming or a full-term pregnancy. Mm. We didn't know there was something in the middle mm. where we ended up having a premature daughter who lived for six months, so she defied the odds. They thought it would be two days. So Special K, it was Carolyn with the K. My mom's name is Carolyn. Mm -hmm. So Carolyn with the K, Special K's uh, doctor at her funeral, he eulogized her and he said, Carolyn Marshall was here to teach us that we're not God. Hmm. He said all the things we thought that would take her out and all that, they didn't. And you said she did have a purpose. There oh, was totally. obviously a clear purpose. But children, um, you wanted children, you and your husband. Yes. So you went down a beautiful road, uh, yes. the road of adoption. Yes. I mean, it's so beautiful. made for you, don't you think? Your kids were made for you. Yes, but I remember telling, it was after my fourth miscarriage, and I remember telling a colleague at work when he, he said, Sent, we have some friends who adopted and maybe you should think about doing that. Because at this point, everybody's concerned. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm going through all these uh, surgeries and blood transfusions and near-death experiences. And so my friends really stepped in and family and said, maybe you guys should adopt. And I remember telling this guy, Tom Villa, I remember saying, Tom, are you nuts? And I can't even believe I told him this. So I'm going to confess. Yeah, right? yeah. I can't believe I told him this. I said, there is no way you can love kids that somebody else had as if they were your own. Uh -huh. That is impossible. Yeah. I am going to have this kid. Yeah. Oh, I was, you know, were I was still adamant. grieving. I was cutting grieving, up. Grieving, sure. I was cutting up on that staircase. I mean, I can still see it. And he just looked at me and he said, Sen, I'm telling you, our friends don't see a difference. I said, they do, and they're just not telling you about it. Mm -hmm. So then later, when we adopted our first, okay, and I sent out pictures, Christmas cards, and it was a picture with the judge and our new son, mm. Kenneth Anthony. And he's two years old, two and a half years old. And the caption said, you know, happy holidays. Anthony adopted us. And we're all just smiling. So my buddy Tom calls. So this is years later. He said, uh, tell me that again. He said, what's that? So he had a bad word. What's that mm, yeah. you told me? He said, uh, 
you can't love people's kids. I said, bye, boy. Just hang up my phone. Hang up my phone. Because obviously, he was right and I was wrong. But you said that your oh. son adopted you. Yes. That's yes. what happened. And he adopted us. He stole our hearts from day wow. one. Little bitty something, literally suffering from failure to thrive, had been abandoned, neglected, born in a bathtub, abandoned when he was nine months old, mm. with his nine-year-old brother taking care of him for two months. Did um, your, your family grew over the years, yes. and that was such a beautiful part of your life. But back to the business side. So AT&T, and we talked about this, they tell yes. you to take your braids down. You do exactly what they say. Right. When you got promotions, did you expect them? Because I'm sure you got no. plenty. No, never, never. I never in my 36 years sought a promotion, never. Really? I was just so, you know, I'm a kid from the projects. I was just so happy to have the job that I had and make the money I was making and things were great and I got a chance to lead and touch people, which is what I'm all about. And so every job I ever had, I loved it. So you are 40 years old. Yes. And you get the call that any person working at a company for a long time would want. Uh, a huge promotion. Huge. 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 Officer. Yeah. So except for there were a couple of strings attached. Uh, just a few. Yeah. Okay, so I walk in, and I'm, I walk in at home, and so the call came in in the evening. And so my husband's sitting there, so he's hearing this call. And my boss tells me that um, the board had just approved me being an officer of the business. And congratulations. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow. And so she says, but he, uh, a few things. She says, I don't want you, you know, you're going to have to tone it down a little bit. I don't want you to laugh so loud. I mean, you're a happy person. You you know, you laugh loud. I can hear it up the hallway, so you're going to have to you know, pull that back. And I'm like, mm, I'm not liking this call, right? And she says, and then uh, I want you to cut your hair. I left a magazine on your desk. And these people, they're black people. They're all in white, some event. And the lady has short hair, so I think you'd look good with that. Um, and then she said, uh, you can't be called sent. Nobody really knows what that is. So it's Cynthia or Cindy. And at this point, I'm like, okay, this is getting kind of crazy. And then she said, and you cannot use the word blessed. I've heard you say that a few times. You just need to say lucky. Mm. And I said, you know what? I don't, I don't think I'm lucky. I'm blessed. And so now it sounds like you're trying to fundamentally change who I am. Mm -hmm. And then she said she didn't want all the people in my office. I had to get distant from the people. I'm like, this is going too far. And bottom line is, I, I turned down the job. Wait, you and turned I, it down? Yes, I did. You turned down the money yes. and the job. I said, you know what? I need you to help me figure out how to say no, because I don't want to offend anybody. I mean, this is big, and I know it's big. I don't want to offend anybody, and I don't want to lose my job, Right. okay? Because I'm not accepting this other job, so help me figure out how to say right. no. And she says, you're right. I don't think you fit the profile. And basically, she was saying she didn't think I was sophisticated enough. And so she says, I'll help you. So my husband's in the background. He's like, you can go to my barber. OK, I got somebody that can cut your hair. You look good in white, because he's hearing me with all this. I'm like, stop. Right. He's like, take the job. Take, take the, the job. job. Yeah. We can figure out this out later. I said, you know, when I first started, y'all made me take out, get rid of my red shoes and take down my braids. Like, wh when does this stop? <laughs> At some point, like, I have to be able to be me. And now you want to change my name? I've been sent my whole life. No. And so then I got a call. From two, I got two calls from two bosses, her bosses. And they started off the call with sent, and they put <laughs> emphasis on it. And I said yes. And they both said they knew what had happened, and they wanted to start all over. And I'll never forget uh, someone telling me, he said, the person that we promoted to be an officer is the person who we want to walk in the door tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He says, and I've been to your office there in San Francisco, and I see your big sign that says, Lord, there's nothing that can happen today that you and I can't handle. I've seen this. And so he goes on to tell me about me mm -hmm. and what he loves about me. Mm. And that's the person Done. who they want to be an officer and who better show up to work tomorrow. And he apologized. That was so powerful. The words of a leader are powerful. Do you know how many women struggle with this, exactly what you're saying? Yes. Because we are always put in boxes with what to wear, yes. how to be how to act. Exactly. And exactly. to be able to have a voice like you did. Right. It was beautiful. You were at one point, and this is such a beautiful image, you were ringing the bell on Wall Street. Oh. You were, you, at Wall Street, ringing the bell. And that image is powerful, but what's more mm. powerful is all your history came washing back. It did, it did. We were outside. So, you know, we had our event with the union that morning and all that. It was, I think, the 30 year anniversary of us on Wall Street, uh, AT&T. And I'm standing on the corner and I look up and I actually see it's Wall Street and another street. 
and I just started crying. Mm. And our CFO, John Stevens, is standing there, and he goes, Sent, what's wrong? And I said, you know, my daddy told us that we were going to be hookers on the street. And I told my mom, I'm going to make money, my money on Wall Street. I'm on Wall Street. This is crazy. So he gives me his, his phone, and I called my mom. Oh. And she just started crying. I said, guess where I am? I said, I'm on Wall Street. And guess what I'm doing today? And she just started crying. It's like, it happened. Oh my God. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. What happened here is a story of loss and salvation. There were residents who hung on for dear life. This is where you took shelter in this closet. I took shelter right in this closet right here. Rioters banged down one of the doors. Have you found a way to reconcile it a year later? It really hurt to see this place that I love so much treated with such disrespect. Was it an act of cleaning or an act of healing? So you have this illustrious career at AT&T and all of a sudden you're retired. You're like, you know what? You worked hard. You I'm deserve chilling. you deserve to chill. <laughs> and then some guy named Mark Cuban from the Mavericks is like, what? I'm the, look, you need to help us. Right. And you're right. like, who are you, Mark? Who, who are you? <laughs> I mean, honestly, he was a, he he Mark and his chief of staff, they were blowing up my cell phone. So I handed my husband the phone and said, because I didn't look at it. And he came back and he said, um, this guy doesn't need any money, uh, you need to call him. It's Mark Cuban. And I said, who? I had to ask him, because I yeah. honestly, I didn't know Mark Cuban. And so he told me who it was, and I said, okay, I'll call him. And he goes, no, you need to hand up that guy. You need to call him right now. Right now. Like, and then when I called him, it was beautiful. He wanted to know if he could see me that afternoon, wanted to know if I had been watching the news, that he was having a crisis, kind of explain what was going on with the Sports Illustrated article coming out and all that. And he was so genuinely disturbed. I mean, what was going this on. is an organization that was really troubled. I mean, troubled. it was smack dab in the middle of a misogynistic culture, yes. um, sexual abuse allegations, all of the worst of the worst. Right. I mean, you, you're being asked to come in there and clean up the house, basically. Right, right. How, how, how are you going to do that? And at first I'm thinking, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. Okay, and so I go and I talk to him. And so then once I talk to him, I just thought, hmm, I gotta go home and pray about this. And that's what I told him. I said, I don't know if I'm gonna do this. And two women stopped me on the way, two women stopped me on the way out of his office and said, are you the person who Mark Cuban said is gonna come in and help us and save us? And I said, well, I don't have the power to save anybody, but I know who does. I said, I don't really know yet. And then they said, well, can we talk to you? And they talked to me and they told me their stories. And I spent time with those women standing right outside of Mark's office. And he wanted me to talk to him. He just kind of nodded like, talk to them. I mean, whatever you can get, whatever you can hear. And so they were just telling me about the culture oh. and how women were being treated and a couple of things that had actually happened to them that they felt were inappropriate. Mm. And they said, we, we need help. You, you have yeah. to come in. The stuff in the article is true. I said, I, I told them I'm going to pray about it. And at this mm -hmm. point, I'm thinking, OK, mm -hmm. maybe I am uniquely qualified to help. Mm -hmm. OK. And so they started telling me what they need, and oh my goodness. So I went home and I prayed about it. I came back the next day. 
And said. And I was in the, I was in the office for three hours before Mark even knew I was in the building because I never made it to his office. People mm. pulled me in a conference room and just started talking to me, wow. men and women, about the workplace. And it just wasn't all just misconduct, no. sexual harassment. Oh, it was a lot of other stuff too, like? Yeah, just uh, performance yeah. issues, favoritism, I mean, yeah. just. But you had to go in one woman and change it. How did you go about it? I laid out a vision uh, from day one that said we would set the global standard in the NBA for diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. because I truly believe that that's where you start. And then I laid out a set of values, the spell crafts, character, respect, authenticity, mm -hmm. fairness, teamwork, and safety, mm -hmm. both physical and emotional safety, and said these will not just be on the walls, but they would operate in the halls. Mm -hmm. Everything we will do, every decision we make, every hire we make, it will be based on this set of values. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what that looks like. And so I went through mm -hmm. each one of them, laid out a 100-day plan that had four parts to it, model zero tolerance, so meaning hotline, mm -hmm. investigation, terminations if mm -hmm. necessary, and, and there were some, right. they, were, they were necessary. Uh, a, a MAVS women's agenda, so really an agenda to educate, elevate, and empower women, because that was missing. Yeah. Uh, and then just cultural transformation around diversity, equity, and inclusion, all that. And then operational effectiveness, just basic things like how you pay people, gender pay equity, all that. And it was about 200 initiatives. We laid it out and said, let's go. And so when the investigator's report came out with the, uh, the 13 things they wanted us mm -hmm. to do, and we had already done just about all of them, uh, he had a press conference. Uh, and he talked about those 13 things okay, and the expectations. Wow. And I believe that press conference was really sending a message mm -hmm. to all of the teams, to the entire league. Here is what we are about and here's what we're not about. And it's slow, it's, it's slow progress. Slow. Yeah, it's how slow much progress. work is there to do, would you say? Oh, we're not done yet. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do. You have been at the helm of the Mavericks mm -hmm. during a time in history that kids are gonna be reading about for a long, long time. This is a social, justice reckoning is happening, George Floyd, all these, these things are happening and you're kind of at the forefront. How has it been navigating these waters? It's been interesting because I, I call it a double pandemic. And what I told our team is that even when, when the NBA shut down, uh, I remember sitting in a conference room the next day after we sent our people home um, and I said, we don't know how long we're not going to be playing basketball, but we're going to be playing the game of life with people. And so what does that look like? Who do we need to help? How do we step up? And I actually ended up coining a phrase called my new dot com because as a leader, different things were important to me now. Having compassion for people, communication had to be done very uh, differently. Community service was at an all time high. We have an opportunity to impact that compromise. Mm -hmm. And that really came out with the George mm -hmm. Floyd situation. And then compliance. It's like we have things that we have to do, like wash our hands, wear a mask, keep our distance early on, okay? And so those are the things we really start to focus on. And so as soon as we really start to focus on that, because we did a lot with the Mavericks for community service. I mean, a lot. We were out there everywhere trying to help essential workers, even essential workers that needed daycare, meals at the hospital. I mean, you name it. We were there. We did, yeah. Virtual, I mean, technology for kids, all that. And then here comes the George Floyd mm -hmm. murder. Mm. And we stepped up and we just decided, you know, my boss was having conversations with folks. I was having conversations, what we call true courageous conversations. Mm. And so we decided to have a big community conversation for Dallas. And we brought 200 community leaders together. Mm. And I said, I want people who represent the systems that undergird systemic racism in this country. Mm. And our theme was listen, learn, unite. Mm. And so we had a big conversation June 9th wow. of last year. It was beautiful. And we said, well, what are we going to unite around? Because we need to take action. Mm -hmm. And so we developed something called MAVS Take Action. And it's advocacy, communication, training, investment, outreach, yeah. and noise. And the yeah. investment is around community investment, economic investment, employment, uh, and just all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was 50 initiatives where we said we are going to have a minimum 10,000 volunteer hours and $5 million minimum right. that we're going to put into making sure that we promote social justice, mm -hmm. we eradicate these racial disparities that exist in all of these different systems right. across healthcare, education, sure. uh, economics, I mean, all that, right? And mm -hmm. we said we want to drive sustainable change. We want mm -hmm. it to last. Mm -hmm. And so we've been doing all kinds of things around that. 
uh, even in our arena. I mean, we've had, you know, situations where just very few people mm -hmm. didn't like the stand we were taking. They didn't yeah. like the fact that our players were playing on a court in the bubble that said Black Lives Matter and all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing is I want to talk to all of these people. I say, anybody who leaves us, I want to talk to them. Mm. They can leave. I mean, we'll, we'll get other right. customers. Let's mm -hmm. listen to each other, mm -hmm. learn from each other. We probably have more in common than differences every now and then. Mm -hmm. You find that's not the case, but usually it's the case. Sure. And nine out of 10 times, the customer would not leave. Nine out of 10 times, they wouldn't leave. We need to talk mm. because we do have some real issues in this country. Yeah, and sure we have do. to respond to those real issues. And what I love about our team, what I love about the NBA is we have the platform. Yeah. We normally bring yeah. people together. We bring people mm -hmm. together all the time. Our arena, we have 41, what I call 41 parties. Right, right, 19,200 right. yeah. people at every party. Yeah, yeah. And so we bring them together. Right. And so people expect us right. to unify people. Right. So why not unify them around these critical issues? Right. So that's what we've been doing. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The United States wins the Is he superhuman? Feel the magic every day. She is a superstar. <laughs> Kayla, we are cheering <laughs> you are. on. Sean White! And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today. Today. Today, Today. Today is where the games begin. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Press. Um, I look at you and I, it's hard to believe that you are a cancer survivor. I don't mm. know why I'm saying that, but because you are lit from inside and you don't have, um, you know, as a cancer survivor myself, sometimes yes. I think about it, sometimes I don't. How bad was it for you? It was bad. I mean, I thought I had months to live. It was bad. When the doctor says I got bad news, sit down. I mean, it's bad and significant. And then he tells me, that I have stage three colon cancer, one lymph node away from stage four. And so I went through brutal chemotherapy for six months. It was how brutal. old were you and how old were your kids? I was, uh, I got that call. I talked to him. I got my colonoscopy the day before my 51st birthday. So my last day of 50. So technically I was in compliance of get a colonoscopy mm -hmm, at 50. 50. And so, and the kids, my, my son was a freshman in college. Mm. Uh, Ricky was a little older. Uh, the girls were still in high school, middle school. So it was, how painful. Crazy. And so we had to tell them. My husband didn't want to tell them. Yeah. And I said, we have to tell them because I, I need these honeys. I need them to be my prayer warriors. Mm -hmm. And, and I, that's, what, that's what I told them. I said, I, I need you to, to, to be in here with us. And they all responded very, very differently. My daughter Shirley just said, I know you're going to die. I've seen the movie mm. Stepmom. Mm. You're going to die and you're not telling us. And oh, it was, it was just brutal. Yeah. It was brutal. In fact, one time Shirley told me, she goes, Mom, you're going to die. You're going to die. I said, why do you think that? She says, because you don't have your clothes on the door the night before, you don't put them on to go to work, and you don't come in at nighttime. She had a routine. It got to the point, Hoda, where I literally started hanging my clothes up on the door. I told my husband, I gotta go in the office just so Shirley can be okay. Hmm. And so one time I went in the office, I stayed in there, I fell asleep, I came home late, I walked in, I was so sick. Shirley was on cloud nine. She said, mommy's gonna live, mommy's gonna oh live. I said, Shirley, why did you say that? She said, it's nighttime. You came home at nighttime and look what you have on, the clothes are on the door. You don't even realize okay, these kids that's... are, you don't realize these kids are in a routine. They're in a routine. Right. And she needed her routine back. And so then I had to just try to get the strength even after mm. 
a bad round of chemo because I'd have nine bad days and five good days. Right. And usually what I try to do is go in the office and do everything in those right. five good days. But I said, I got to try to fake my way through some of these yeah. nine days just yeah. for the kids. Just wow. for the kids. Um, you're so fascinating. <laughs> when is the movie coming out? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm writing a book about my cancer journey. I'm finally writing a book about it. When you look at all the things that you've overcome, what was the, which if you had to like put them in order, what would be the most difficult thing you think you ha that, that you had to overcome in your life of all of these things? I would say letting go of what I thought was my plan. Mm. That I had this plan of I was gonna have a family, what mm -hmm. it was gonna look like, all that. And having that be truly one of the first times in my life where it just didn't go according right, just like you thought. to my plan. Right. And I had to let it go and just realize that there was a plan operating bigger than my plan. Mm -hmm. And I have proof that it all turned out. Well, hello everybody. It is a beautiful Tuesday. Welcome to Popstar Plus. On the show today, we're gearing up for the Winter Olympics with Team USA star Sean White is going to answer some of the most Googled questions about snowboarding. And later, we're celebrating 40 years of late night. But first, here's your pop star for today. The first up, Bob Saget on Sunday. The actor was honored by friends and family in a farewell concert at LA's famous comedy store. It was hosted by Jeff Ross, John Stamos, and John Mayer. The show saw Bob Saget's stand up buddies, including Jim Carrey, wow. Chris Rock, Ooh. John Lovitz, and a bunch of others paying tribute to their late friend. Stamos and Mayer, who were both pallbearers at the funeral, formed an impromptu house band. The sold out evening was a benefit for the Scleroderma Foundation, of course, which was a near dear cause to Bob's heart since losing a sister to that disease. We're going to hear a lot more on Bob's life and legacy and a special conversation with his Full House co star, Candace Cameron Bure. That is this Thursday right here on oh, Today. Wow. Next up, Jennifer Lopez, the singer and actress, graces the cover of People's Love Issue and opening up about her own life and rekindled romance with Ben Affleck. JLo told the magazine, I feel so lucky and happy. You okay, Craig? And proud to be with him. It's a beautiful love story that we, right. we got a second on. chance. Team the wrong pipe. Sorry. You believe JLo, though, right? I do. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's not a reflection. I thought you were calling oh, a little off. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, we used to do that I in think seventh she's grade, in love. but we did he something did. else with the... Yeah, I'm sorry about that. He did choke. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard to believe. Okay. Uh, yeah. The new issue of People Hits Newsstands on what Friday. She say? And you can yeah, we find missed it because all the She's comments. happy to have the second chance. And okay. she's proud okay. of the relationship and happy about it. I thought you were just emotionally touched by that. Uh, well, I do love JLo. So yeah. Yeah, maybe that was. <clears throat> sorry. You like Ben? Today.com's got a lot more. We're going to catch up with JLo on this and her new movie, Marry Me, when she stops by our studio Ooh. on Thursday. Good catch with the water there. Wow. Next up, look who it is. Huh. Who was it? Samantha Guthrie. Oh, oh In an what? interview Why? airing today on the Drew Barrymore show, Samantha uh, talks all about her the upcoming Olympics. Uh, you have a cooking show? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, that's ironic. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it is. I didn't yes. know that. They gave you a cooking show? I know. It's weird. What do you do on that show? Uh, you learned how to cook. Like, oh, you learned learn how to cook. Yeah, yeah. Oh, draw okay. blood. Genius idea. Yeah, hurt myself. You also get a new tattoo <laughs> with Drew. Let's take a look at what? this clip. Well, exactly. Would you ever get a tattoo? I would, and I kind of want to right now. Like my mother's just rolling her eyes. I, I would get a tattoo with you. Yes. Anytime. Do By you want to get another one? Yeah, I want to get one right here. Oh, so oh. what's happening? So what are you gonna? No, we are gonna get a tattoo. Uh -huh. together. Not a matching tattoo. No. She's got something she wants to do, and uh -huh. I'm Where are you working it out. If I did it, I might put something really small, like on uh, my arm. Maybe a little something. frying pan. <laughs> yeah, like just to, to mark my cooking journey. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm good idea. About this. Uh -huh. Yeah, the tattoo. Yeah. Well, you've got an earring. I have That's to keep up. Well, you know, so. Yeah. Next Wait, why are you looking at me like I'm that? I'm just thinking about how, what kind of lettering you're going to do. Feldy. You're going to do Feldy, right? <laughs> what sort of font you'll use. Yes. We'll catch that whole conversation uh, with <laughs> Drew and SG. Uh, check your local listing for that. All right, we're going to turn to our Super Bowl commercial kickoff series, and it's a doubleheader this morning. Starting things off, we've got a sneak peek at Telemundo's ad for this year's World Cup featuring legendary sports commentator Andres Cantor. And in the spot, he's teaching America the only way to truly celebrate a World Cup goal. Drop the 
Feet yeah. Cup uh, and that's Cutter a good one. Kicks good off one. November 21st. You can catch awesome. the Spanish language broadcast. Be sure to tune in to Telemundo. Or, of course, you can check out the stream of the games on Peacock. And finally, Charlie Puth in his new Super Bowl spot. He's teaming up with Megan Thee Stallion for Frito-Lays, Flamin' Hot Cheetos, and Doritos. Ooh. And together, they make a wild pair. Take a look. What's up, Charlie? Good morning, man. Spot looks great. Morning, everybody. Hi. Yeah, <laughs> it's early. So you get the call for the Super Bowl spot. Megan the Stallion's going to play a bird singing push it. What were you thinking? I was thinking how appropriate it is for you to be a part of this. They, Rito Lay reached out to me. They wanted me to just, I've never done voiceover work before. And I was a little, in, I was a little nervous. And they were like, just be yourself. Just do your little, <laughs> do your little beatbox thing. So it's super easy. That's super fun. Um, you're known for your collaborations. You've worked with so many artists. Uh, did this open up a door for maybe you and Megan getting together in the studio? Megan's so talented. Yeah, I would like to hear Megan do more R&B leaning type type stuff. Um, yeah, maybe I can help with that. You know what, Charlie? It's interesting. We were talking to uh, your your very close friend, Sir Elton John. The Lockdown yeah. Sessions was a great record that came out, and he tells this great story about going to your house and going to the home studio and how you guys just really hit it off. Tell me a little bit about your relationship. It's, it's outlandish because I found out that I'm next door neighbors with Elton John without revealing our address that would be bad to do on the Today Show. But uh, when he when he sent me the address originally to uh, or to pick him up, it was walking distance. So that was an easy trip. Well, it's a pretty cool thing. We're looking forward to your record, Charlie, coming out light switch. Mm -hmm. You've documented everything on TikTok. So we're going to be checking that out soon. And we'll be watching for the Super Bowl ad, buddy. Thanks so much for getting up. We appreciate it. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. And now the reason we call the show Popstar Plus, a few extra headlines. And first up, and just like that, if you just can't get enough of the latest chapter in the Sex and the City series, you are in luck. HBO Max is releasing a documentary on the making of Sarah Jessica Parker's new show. And behind the scenes, film's going to take a look at what it was like expanding the cast, crafting the scripts, and of course, all the fashion. Now for four months. What? What? Oh, action. Wow. Oh. Tomorrow we have the very first scenes in the show. Roll it! Even 23 years in, I'm excited. Terrified and excited. It's unbelievable. It's a big deal. I know, I'm panicked, I'm panicked. I knew Cynthia was a director because I'd seen plays that she's done. Cut. She knows us so well, and she knows acting so brilliantly. It's everything. We're here, and it's a testament to these three actresses. And just like that, the documentary, that's going to start streaming on February 3rd. And finally, Encanto. Well, it seems like everybody is talking about this one. From the movie's hit soundtrack, We Don't Talk About Bruno is an absolute certified hit. The track just spent its third week at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and has officially tied for all-time highest charting song from a Disney animated movie. We Don't Talk About Bruno shares that top spot with Aladdin's A Whole New World, and it flies past Frozen's Let It Go. So kudos to Lin-Manuel Miranda and the amazing cast of Encanto. That soundtrack is on full repeat in the Daily House. And those are today's Pop Star Plus headlines. Coming up, Olympic legend Sean White tells us what he's been listening to as he prepares for the Winter Games. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The Today Show's newest fan. Al Roker.
These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. The Winter Olympics begin in just two days. And ahead of the action, we were lucky enough to sit down with the most popular snowboarder on the planet, three-time gold medalist, Sean White. And he gave us some answers to the most Googled questions about his sport and who he thinks are the top athletes to watch. I would hope I, I'm one of the top snowboarders you'd want to tune in to see. There's an amazing Australian snowboarder named Scotty James. He'll be one to watch. Amazing Japanese snowboarders, one named Ayumu, and then another one named Yuto. And so the four of us will be the ones really kind of battling it out, I think, at this next Olympics. And then on the women's side, definitely for the USA, would be Chloe Kim will be defending her title. So really awesome riders. Toby Miller, really amazing kid. And I invited him to come sit on some of the sessions I was doing. And then as he got older, he kind of joined the circuit and we had a relationship from before when he was really young and his parents were, were there with him. And um, so we kind of took him under our wing, my coach and I, and, and it's just so amazing to see him now at that level where he's, you know, potentially going to make the team. So I'm pulling for him and going to be hopefully side by side with him trying to uh, help him achieve that. Snowboarders wear backpacks um, because they have to have a lot of equipment with them. It's like survival gear and you usually have a shovel and you have a probe and the probe is if somebody gets caught in an avalanche you then take this probe and stick it down through the snow to see if you feel a human being under the snow. <laughs> And then usually you want a snack or something else, water, probably some warmer gloves, things like that. No, I've I have never I'm gonna knock on that one here. I've never been in a situation where I've needed it. I've definitely known people that have been very thankful that they had that equipment with them. It's kind of mandatory when you go out into the uncharted areas. Um, it's kind of like wearing your seatbelt in the car. You hope you never have to use it, but you got it. <laughs> I think it's something where, you know, you're going down the run and it's hard to kind of just teeter on one edge. You're kind of waiting for somebody to catch up or you're trying to figure out where to go next. It's like a bicycle pulling up at a light and you take a foot off and you put it on the ground rather than just kind of sitting there trying to balance. But it's frustrating because it gets cold and your hands get wet. And <laughs> I try to stand as much as I can. Plus we don't have poles, so we can't lean. Obviously, I picked it up quickly as a kid, but I'd say no, it's just different. You know, maybe skiing is slightly easier just because we walk this way. Cool, go forward, and this is backwards, and I, I kind of understand this. And your feet aren't stuck together, so it's kind of like you can walk and you can kind of do natural motions that you're used to. Where snowboarding, you're kind of locked in, and learning the edges and things like that is kind of difficult. But I will say that with snowboarding later on, you'll realize that without the extra equipment of the poles and ski boots, personally, I think are very uncomfortable. The boots and snowboarding, they're warm, they're comfortable, less equipment. And something about like the flow of, you know, carving down the mountain when you don't have all that stuff is just incredible. And I can only say this because I skied actually in the beginning when I was four until I switched to snowboarding around like seven or so. It's kind of like what people do first as well. And then they kind of like, do I really want to start from the beginning again and learn something brand new or do I just stick to what I know? So I, I would say that's why the introduction scheme is a bit easier. I do, but I play it through my phone speakers and I just put my phone in my chest pocket. I know a ton of people that listen to music in headphones. 
I like a lot of oldies and things, and then newer bands like rock stuff. I like Black Keys and Tame Impala. You know, it's kind of like what song you can hear, but not not focused too much on. And then and then you need something that's kind of like got some push to it. I'm an avid guitar player. I pick like rock, rock heavy songs. It's good to have a song because usually, you know, you're kind of like the horse in the start gate. You hear the the pistol go or you hear that song and it clicks back into this situation or something that you would work out to is great. Oh, I know this is when I got to put in the hard work or this is going to set the stage for what I'm about to do. So I think it's a really powerful thing, music. Especially it's like the, the soundtrack to your life at that point. You're like, what is this moment? Is this, this nervousness I feel inside? Or that song kicks on and you go, oh, wow. You know, that, that those nerves turn into like, maybe this is my day. Maybe this is my moment. It's like my, my song is playing, like I'm ready. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty great. Of course, we're gonna be rooting for Sean and all of the rest of Team USA. Coming up next, we're diving into 40 years of late night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. The Today Show's newest fan. This is the little Al Roker. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Well, it's hard to believe... It's been 40 years since David Letterman hosted the very first Late Night right here on NBC. And one of the show's big fans and a former guest on it, I'll have you know, Harry Smith, has a look back at what made that show so special. Can't believe it, but 40 years ago today, wow. a little show called Late Night with wow. David Letterman premiered right here on NBC. In its original 11-year run, Late Night racked up five Emmys, a Peabody, and a fandom that embraced the weird, sarcastic, and crazy comedy that brought Letterman to it. One of those fans also happens to be a former <laughs> guest on that show, our very own Harry, Harry. Smith. Harry, where are you, buddy? So uh, fans of the show will recognize the idea of someone hanging out a window, say a second story window, maybe even a little higher on the top of the building and holding something, I don't know, like a watermelon or a cake. Um, so we've, uh, we hope sufficiently jogged your memory because something really special is coming up. But in the meantime, a little traipse down memory lane with David Letterman. First off, we fans never knew there was a show called Late Night. Welcome to our show, it's Late Night and... Uh... 40 years ago, we knew it as, and called it, Letterman. And the number one shocking revelation about Mick Jagger, uh, once slept with Robert Redford for free. And, uh... and we talked about it constantly. Like, did you see Letterman last night? Ignition. 
It appears that David oh. Letterman has come out of that mission. This is the stupidest thing I've ever witnessed network money spent on. And, and frankly, I'm proud to be a part of it. Let's get physical, physical. As a talk show, it was conventional, only in that it had a desk and a host and a band. It was irreverent. Hey, shut up! Often silly. Sometimes sardonic. We didn't really plan today's show. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it still can't be fun. This is the uh, General Electric building, and, you know, I have a little gift, and we thought, what the heck, let's just drop in and... And uh, always you know, say hello. in uh, on its own jokes. You mean we need authorization to drop off a yes. fruit basket? Yes. Yes. To drop off a fruit basket? Yes, you need authorization. Oh, this is going to be fun to work with these people, isn't it? Steve O'Donnell was Letterman's head writer for 10 years. So bring me to the day-to-day. -day. You become head writer of this show. It's Monday morning. You're in the writer's room. And what's it like in there? The experience of putting on a, a late-night comedy show was like simultaneously putting out a small-town newspaper and organizing every single day a small-town parade. Because they were various... <laughs> and while David Letterman didn't exactly invent irony, he and his writers conspired to make it a kind of comedy we couldn't get enough of. Like, so what, like two of them toasted. There was a little freedom to experiment. In one way, the pressure was on to do an interesting show, but there was also like, man, no one's watching, so we could do the most strange, <laughs> surreal things we could. Until Letterman, the laws of late night consisted of a monologue, host laughing at guest stories, and maybe a song. It was not this. <laughs> or this. There, there's very little I can do from this position. And then there was Larry Bud Melman. Good night, everybody! <laughs> Neither fish nor fowl. Well, why don't you crawl on the oh, fence and right. take a nap? But more of a befuddled foil. Sleep tight. A frequent comic non sequitur. I hope it didn't hurt your glasses. Played by the late Calvert DeForest. The Letterman regulars were often within reach. Bob Costas, Marv Albert, and yes, Al Roker. What's this? I think you ought to think about having that biopsy. <laughs> the Letterman owes some debt to TV pioneers Steve Allen and Ernie Kovacs. Letterman boldly discarded the norms, besmirched the bean counters, and glorified in the dump. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Harry Smith. Harry, come on. Guests like this reporter feared we'd not be able to roll with I think, oh no, we did, we made fun of you. Yeah, oh, that's, that's right, you, you were nice to her and you were Yeah, that, that's how that works, and tonight we'll make fun of her and be nice to you. <laughs> and sometimes there was an uncomfortable Dave Guest dynamic. I thought that I would never want to do this show with you. Now why? Because you thought I was uh, uh... an <laughs> David Letterman did not break the mold. He melded it to fit his vision. And a big part of watching the show was watching Dave enjoy what he had wrought. Have a good night. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah, so we have the cake. And in just in case you don't remember, just roll this tape. Roll this tape. Take a look at this for a second. Yeah, lots of cakes, lots of stuff. <laughs> <Flying. laughs> uh, okay, sure. Happy birthday. Right? Oh, God. Yeah. Just cuz? All right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yep. Okay. So here we go, kids. Bob, you want to zoom in on this? See, it says, happy 40th anniversary, late night. Nice. And of the things that I've done on live television over 40 years or so, in the words of David Letterman, this may be about the most lame. <laughs> but are you ready? That's yeah. Good. Okay. It's a good We're going to try this. Here we go. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. There right. you have it. Nice bidding yeah. tribute there. Mr. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, Mr. Whose Roper, house is that? A frequent guest on Letterman. We do what we can. Mm -hmm. Oh, some good uh, look backs there. Classic Letterman moments. We want to mention David Letterman himself is tonight's special guest on Late Night with Seth Meyers. Looking forward to that one. Coming up here on Popstar Plus, a throwback with the lovely Blythe Danner. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist.
Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. In the city of angels, two kindly old ladies wanted to help homeless men get off the streets forever. And so they did. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, the new podcast from Dateline and Keith Morrison. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. Blythe Danner is turning 79 this week, and in honor, we're heading into the vault. We've got a moment from 1990 where she brought up her daughter and, of course, friend of today, Gwyneth Paltrow. Blythe Danner won the Tony Award for her rapturous Broadway performance in Butterflies Are Free. She's been acclaimed again and again for her portrayals in television dramas. And she achieved a kind of motion picture immortality as the wife of Robert Duvall and the mother of Michael O'Keefe in The Great Santini with its unforgettable scenes of a family in crisis. Opening in the coming months, Blythe Danner in three big movies that people are sure to be talking about. You're a very busy young woman. Hi, Jean. Young woman, thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's in a good mood. I'm, yes, I've been dancing all over the country mm -hmm. this year. You've been in three mm -hmm. big movies that are not out yet. Yeah. One is Mr. and Mrs. Bridge with Paul Newman and uh, Joanne Woodward. Tell me Woodward's about that picture. The Newmans. Uh, it's a wonderful, it's adapted from um, uh, two novels that were combined to one, Mr. Bridge, Mrs. Bridge by Evan Canal, which I guess is a considered a cult classic, C-U-L-T. He's, he's a wonderful writer, and I had known about it before this uh, movie, but it's, it really is um, sort of about the social mores of the 1940s in the Midwest. It's a very interesting story. Are they sort of middle-class country club set people? Yeah, yeah, that's better. You said it better than I did. <laughs> and it was shot some of it in yeah. Kansas City, wasn't it? It was all shot in, at least though the part I was in was in Kansas City. Are you a nice person in this movie, Blythe? I play an interesting person who, who actually is the only person who really sees it all kind of clearly, it sees this life and tries to escape, and she does, but I won't tell you how. Okay. She's kind of... Um, then from there you went, obviously, to New York, because Woody Allen directed, and he doesn't usually travel far afield. No, he doesn't like to go So you're home. in the new, untitled Woody Allen yes, movie. Yes, untitled. I don't know how long it will remain untitled, but it's untitled. I play Mia's sister. Mia Farrow's that sister? Was, yes, Mia Farrow's sister. That was, that was fun. I just sort of danced in and out of these. You know, there were nice small parts, good parts, but small parts. So it allowed me to be home a lot, which was good, too. Then you were in the Carolinas doing a movie with Barbara Streisand. Yes, very dear to my heart because, you know, it's another Pat Conroy novel. And having done The Great Santini and going back to that place, Beaufort, South Carolina, which is the love of my life. If I ever retire, that's where I'm going. And all my friends down there, you know, these marvelous people. So I was able to go. I was dying for that part because I wanted to go back and see everybody. And it was also very nice to be in the movie. It was great. Uh, Barbara was fantastic. You know, I thought she might be a prima donna, but she was anything but. I mean, she's directing, she's producing, she's starring in it. And I think she must get about five hours sleep a night. I think she's a good director. She directed Gentle, and I thought yes. that was excellent. Wonderful, yeah. Also, the fact that she's an actor makes it very... Uh, she knows what, what actors go through and all their insecurities and frailties and insanity. So she's very understanding and, and very good about that. She worked, and yet she's very, very direct. She's good. I'm really glad you set the record straight about her for this moment at any rate, because yeah. people do have a very weird impression of Barbara Streisand as some kind of a, a witch tyrant who comes on a set on a broom or something. I well, think she's a wonderful person. I think, you know, because she's so direct. She's a woman, she's direct, she's tough, and that she knows exactly what she wants, and she works you very hard. But that's what it's about, you know. I mean, you, you want to work hard. What is Nick Nolte's role in the movie? 
Nick Nolte plays the football coach who um, drives the film, really, who is, I'm married to Nick Nolte, and he has an affair with Barbra Streisand, uh -huh. who is the psychiatrist of his sister. <laughs> you stay with him? Uh, I'm not going to tell you that. Would you stay in real life? With Nick Nolte? No, no, I think you might. <laughs> you have a very busy family. Not only are you a successful actress, and you have two wonderful children, Jake and Gwyneth, yes. and you have a very successful husband, Bruce Paltrow, who created, produced, Saved Elsewhere. Yes, he was the executive producer, he was the creator. Now, he works primarily in Hollywood, and you're making movies in New York, in Kansas City, in Beaufort, South Carolina. You have two children in yeah. their early teens. Now, how do you become a mother and actress and, and do all this? Oh, don't ask me, Gene. I am asking if only, you. If only, I under, if only I knew. You just do it. You go day to day, and you try to do the best you can, you know? So I know I sound like I never stop, but I, I do, honestly. <laughs> well, anybody who doesn't know the work of Blythe Danner, We'll have plenty of chance to see her in many, many roles in the coming months, that's clear. Thank you very much. You're a terrific lady. Thanks, Gene. Can I have your hat? After I'm done with it. Okay. And a happy early birthday to you, Blythe. Thanks for watching, everybody. That is Popstar Plus. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Have a great day. Hello, all you lovelies in Today All Day Land. Happy Tuesday to you, and we're happy you are with us. It is the first day of February. I love when they find us. This is our digital show, you guys, Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about the show in 30 minutes. we got a lot to get to. We do, and once again, our top story is the weather. Another big winter storm in the works already. This one stretches from the Rockies all the way up to New England, so we're going to keep you up to date with the very latest. And then Craig has a story celebrating Black History Month. He'll introduce us to a remarkable pastor who's working to erase the troubling past of a once segregated movie theater, one that he used to go to, by transforming it in a really profound way. You do not want to miss that one. Yeah, Ben Al had a great story in the third hour. It's all about a brotherhood of men leaning on each other and healing through the power of yoga. Oh, and one of our fourth hour favorites joined us, Michelle Buteau. Okay, she's super funny, but she's also hitting the big screen with none other than J-Lo. Oh, it's a rom-com called Marry Me. All right, stay tuned. Lots of laughs. <laughs> Let's get this show on the road. Namaste. It's time for Today, Today in 30. Let's get right to his forecast. Hey, Al, good morning. Hey, guys, good morning. So now we are talking about 82 million of us dealing with winter weather. Look at this. We've got winter w storm watches stretching from New Mexico down through Texas, Oklahoma, all the way into the northeast. Winter storm warnings to the north of that. This is going to be a multi-day event. So tomorrow evening, we're going to be looking at this cold front, or I should say this evening, this cold front is going to draw mo moisture in from the Gulf, bring cold Cold air from the north, and that's going to stretch snow from Texas on into Michigan. Then tomorrow morning, that storm will really blow up, blossom with heavy snow, significant ice, difficult travel, very dangerous, slippery conditions. This is what we're looking for tomorrow, tonight into tomorrow. Significant ice from Texas all the way into Missouri and on to the north. We're looking also at moderate snow from Denver to Amarillo up to Wichita, Oklahoma. Oklahoma City. Now we move on into Wednesday into Thursday morning. This slow moving storm is going to gradually move eastward. Rain will change to ice and snow from Arkansas all the way into an Ohio in the northeast. Wednesday to Thursday, look for power outages, major disruptions in transportation from roads to airports. And then we're looking at drain dangerous travel conditions with a significant snow from Springfield all the way to Detroit and back into western New York. And then we move into Friday morning morning. The front finally moves off the eastern seaboard, but we're looking for a wintry mix for parts of the I-95 corridor. We could be looking at icing conditions stretching from interior Pennsylvania, upstate New York, into New England, and even here in the northeast, the snow should be more significant up to the north. We're not going to put accumulations out there yet because this is still Friday. We're still watching it, but we are going to be uh, tracking this very closely, guys, because it is a changeable situation, but it's going to be affecting a huge swath of the country right on into Friday. Wow. Okay. All right, Al. Thank you.
first day of February, the start of American Heart Month. And we've got an exclusive first look this morning at a new Cleveland Clinic survey, and it reveals the pandemic's impact on our heart health, and it's a big impact. Yeah, some of the results are really shocking. So here they are. 41% of Americans have experienced at least one heart-related issue. 77% say they're more likely to sit through the day compared to before the pandemic. 34% with a family of history of heart disease feel there is nothing they can do to limit their own risk. Joining us now with more NBC medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. So Dr. John, let's start with that first graphic we just put up there. Nearly half of Americans saying they had some sort of heart related issue since March of 2020. What does that tell you? And Craig, what it tells me mainly is that the pandemic right now has taken a bigger toll than just the COVID itself. And I think most people realize COVID is a respiratory infection, but it's also an infection that could affect our cardiovascular system, our heart system. And what people are experiencing are having things like shortness of breath, chest pain, rapid heart rates, those types of things. And so it's not only just taking a toll respiratory wise, but physically on your heart also on your health, on your mental health, which can add stress to your heart as well. And people tend to be putting off their doctor visits and that can be an issue too, because if they are having heart related issues, they need to get those checked into, especially if they continue on long term, Craig. Yeah, a huge issue, Dr. Torres, and it makes sense with the pandemic. So many people were at home, working from mm -hmm. home, sitting on Zooms all day. And I emphasize sitting. 77% of Americans are more likely to spend the entire day sitting now than before compared to the, mm. the, the before the pandemic. And that has a huge issue on your heart. It, it does have a very significant issue because our bodies are made to get up and move around. That's the one thing we do, one thing we're made to do. And when we sit, if you think about it, our legs and our glute muscles essentially get inactivated. You're not moving around at all. And those are the bigger muscles in your body that help with your metabolism. So if that doesn't happen, if you're not moving around, you sit down more, you end up gaining more weight, you increase stress on your body, you increase blood sugar levels. And one statistic I thought the survey had, which is pretty interesting, millennials and Gen Zers were more than twice as likely to sit for 14 hours a day on the average oh. than boomers and 14 hours a day if you think about it that is most of the day sitting that is not good okay, wow boomer. Well, okay boomer <laughs> all right you know what i thought that stat was interesting <laughs> you said a third of people who have a family history of heart disease think there's nothing they can do i was born this way is that the case that is the case. And for Hispanics, Latinos, it's even more so. It's 41 percent. And so, you know, the thinking is in that group that my family has a history of heart disease. My mom or dad might have died from a heart related issue. There's nothing I can do about it. But there are things you can do and there are interventions. The main one being diet, Mediterranean plant based diets. We know those are extremely important to get your cholesterol under control, to get your heart healthy medications. If you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, you want to do that. Quit smoking yeah. if you're a smoker. That is by far one of the biggest things you can do. All these can help. There is not any kind of intervention that won't really help get your heart healthy again. And so you just need to start doing those things, including that moving we're talking about during the day, Hoda. Stick around because there's much more coming up on Today in 30. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. I believe, I believe. Every dream, journey, and triumph. And it all starts here. The United States, let's go! Feel the magic every day. The excitement is in the air. At the Winter Olympics, today is where the games begin. Got that magic. Ooh, the answer's gone. Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker.
back now with Carson and our special series Together We Rise, celebrating black history. That's right. Good morning, guys. Craig, you met a small town pastor who's committed to rewriting the narrative of racism by turning a theater with a troubled history into a beacon of hope and understanding. Yeah, cool. thanks. Thanks. I was uh, honored to meet Reverend David Kennedy. Reverend Kennedy was growing up and he went to his local movie theater. And when he was doing that, he had to sit up in the segregated section. Well, now... He owns that theater along with his church, and they have plans for a groundbreaking makeover. We should note, to properly tell the story, we needed to use images that you may find disturbing. Just outside the town square in Lawrence, South Carolina, a brand new marquee sits above the Echo Theater. But inside, it's gutted. The seats and stage have been ripped out. Only a dirt floor remains. In fact, the only remnant of the theater sorted past is a painting of a giant swastika fading on the wall. After seeing this, it might surprise you to learn that the owners of the theater are Reverend David Kennedy and his church. Reverend Kennedy, as I understand it, you used to come here when you were a little boy to see movies. Yes. You know, I used to come come up through right. through that way. Right. That was the right. that was the segregated Back in. entrance for the right. for the blacks. It started as a segregated theater. From there, the theater's history is as compelling as any movie. It became a Ku Klux Klan headquarters and an international meeting space for hate groups. It was also home to a store called the Redneck Shop, which sold all kinds of white supremacist memorabilia. When the Redneck Shop opened in 1996, Reverend Kennedy started protesting. This space where we're sitting right now, what, what did it used to be? When you came in, they had all kind of racist uh, clan material. They had little wooden dolls with ropes around their necks. But a change of heart changed everything. Michael Burden, who owned the theater, decided to leave the clan and was ostracized. The Reverend found him and his family living in a truck and guided by faith and forgiveness, he decided he had to help. I, I didn't have a choice, I had to. When the mandate of need is there, you can't be reluctant in taking care of human beings. An unlikely friendship was born and Burden decided to sell the building to Reverend Kennedy. Their story, inspiring a book and movie. And after winning a years long court battle, the Reverend is ready to reinvent the theater. What do you want this space to be? I'm trying to, I'm trying to fight some, bit, some of my emotions. That's okay. We want it to be a place where we focus on all races. I want it to be a place where diversity is not only talked about, but it is lived and celebrated. Mm. Uh, I, I didn't know that he was alive. To help realize his vision, the Reverend enlisted Reagan Freeman. The 25-year-old grew up nearby and had plans to go to law school until he learned the history of lynching in Lawrence County. That history includes the Reverend's great uncle, Richard Puckett, lynched in 1913 from a railway trestle. What is the Echo Project? The Echo Project is about reckoning with the dark past, confronting it directly, and trying to make some good come out of it. It's about getting justice. It's about finding peace. The past lives all over the town of Lawrence. The place where Reverend Kennedy's uncle was lynched is overgrown, but not forgotten. A statue of a Confederate soldier keeps watch in the town square. But around the corner, from the dirt floor of the Echo Theater, Reverend Kennedy hopes to build a space for healing, understanding, and forgiveness. In this world, we have to be forgiven. Some things do not come overnight. Some things have to come by prayer. Should say amen. Uh, by the way, the Echo Project has gotten some major support. A leading architect has volunteered his services. And the design team behind the National Memorial for Peace and Understanding in Birmingham, Alabama, they've gotten involved as well. I grew up an hour from that place. Mm -hmm. Had no idea, no idea about the story until someone emailed me. His ability.
to forgive yeah. is like crazy. is incredible. And he's lived it. His he's entire lived life. It. His entire wow. life. There's no wow. understanding without forgiveness. Oh. Mm -hmm. What will they do at that space that you were sitting in? Will it stay that, like that way? Or their they... their vision right now is for part of the space to to be a theater, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and the other part is going to be an area where, as the Reverend said there, where folks can gather and talk and heal uh, and celebrate diversity. So they're they're living it. He's living yeah. the mm -hmm. diversity. He's living the forgiveness. It's just mm -hmm. like When he saw that guy in his truck living with his family, yeah. he, he had a choice in that moment. Yeah. He could have yeah. killed the guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he went the other way. It's yeah. an incredible lesson. Yeah. That was awesome, Craig. Thank you. Really. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are back with an unexpected brotherhood created by two guys who were seeking a way to stay social and relieve stress. They ended up creating a whole movement that's all about community and a little flexibility. The power of relationships is one of the greatest currencies that any of us can have. And the relationships that have been born out of this organization have been unmatched. For 36-year-old Tristan Lewis and Andrew Smith, 32, the lockdown during the summer of 2020 was both too quiet and too loud. The stay-at-home advisory is meant to slow coronavirus. The headlines only grow more worrisome. As the unfolding nationwide protests created a vacuum of stress and anxiety. So guys, I'm curious, uh, how did you both get into yoga. That story really starts at the crux of 2020. The death of basketball legend Kobe Bryant sending shockwaves through the sports world and beyond. We experienced the loss of NBA legend Kobe Bryant. Months later, we experienced a, a global pandemic and then also all the civil unrest that was happening across the country. And um, when George Floyd's passing occurred, um, we were going through a lot of different stuff, as Tristan said, a lot of different traumas. Um, and Tristan had the idea that we needed to do something that was gonna be good for our mind, our body, and our soul. The two friends asking a yoga teacher to conduct a class in Chicago as a one-time event on a Sunday. Word quickly spreading and students immediately asking for more. After this session, multiple guys came up and told Andrew and I, this is something that I didn't realize I needed. So we, we realized that we tapped into something in that moment. When black guys are gonna get together, you know, usually it's some, something very physical and it involves some trash talk, some smack. So were you surprised at, at, at how much you needed this? I was incredibly surprised. One of the things that I needed most was community. 
Um, I needed to be around my brothers. And one of the things that we have noticed is that there's a lack of black men who are teaching yoga. You know, when you enter into a room as a black man, you're scanning the room real quickly and seeing who is there that looks like you, right? Tristan and Andrew say they noticed the classes were creating friendships based on openness and honesty. And with this being a mental health practice, it opened up the door for us to talk about the issues that we were going through. It opened up the door for us to be transparent and to be vulnerable. So those things just expounded uh, the practice as a whole and brought more brothers into the fold. Before they knew it, a class that began with 20 guys quickly grew into a new nonprofit, The Healing, a space dedicated to helping black men become their best selves. Generationally, there's been a lot of stigmas and stereotypes when it pertains to black men uh, being vulnerable or even just what a black man is supposed to be. So I think there is something encouraging when a guy can show up and lower his shame and be open and honest about exactly where he is in his life. And I think normalizing that behavior has definitely had an impact on the guys in our community. Tristan and Andrew saying they've also made counselors and therapists available to the community. Has it occurred to you that if this pandemic hadn't happened, if we weren't put into this position, that this program probably would have never happened? A hundred percent. You know, I think what the pandemic offered was a sense of stillness that I don't think we would have had if the pandemic didn't shut things down. While running the healing keeps them busy, Tristan works in IT and Andrew, a financial advisor, but both intending to practice what they preach. Do I understand correctly that you're both now inspired, you're getting certified as yoga instructors? That's correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, just truly grateful that we're able to steward what it is that we have right now. Now, the average age is 25 to 38. Guys say they're expanding their programs with black businesses and organizations, and they want to start to expand their philanthropic outreach to the city of Chicago itself, which started with a holiday toy drive last Christmas. That's so neat. Yeah, yeah. I would love That's to take part story. in that. Absolutely, right. absolutely. It's just good for your mind. It, it does. The right and it changes your whole day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. I believe, I believe every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The United States wins the most Is he superhuman? Feel the magic every day. She is a superstar. <laughs> Kayla, we are cheering you yeah. on. And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today, today, today. Today, today is where the games begin. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Listen to The Thing About Helen and Olga, new from Dateline, wherever you get your podcasts. Our friend Michelle Buteau is having a moment. Not only is Netflix basing a comedy series on her book of essays, she's also, <laughs> hold on, we got to get the shot. Let's see that book. She's yes. also in a movie with J-Lo. Uh, Michelle's in the new rom-com, Marry Me. You know who else is in it? Hoda. Oh. But okay, she's about a music star played by J-Lo who finds out her fiance is cheating on her, so she decides to marry a random stranger, mm -hmm. a teacher played by Owen Wilson instead. And Michelle is right there in the mm -hmm. middle of it. Joy Lowe's assistant, Melissa. Take a look. Today's show is a go at 10 on Tuesday. Sorry. They want to... Um, um, Charlie. Charlie in studio and Cat Remote from London. Cat. Excuse me one second. I just <laughs> take the call. Bye, yeah. Cat. Everything's set up. She's like, like a real person. What's going on? Oh, we're booking interviews all week. <laughs> it's all in your email. I don't check my emails a lot. How do you schedule your life if you don't check your email? 
easy. I can't do anything between eight and three, Monday through Friday. And I have math club after school and three days a week I have my kid. Beyond that, I'm pretty much available. So sorry. Melissa. Melissa, you're gonna have to move the Today Show. What, excuse me? We don't move the Today Show. We move for the Today Show. <gasps> Wait, That's what? Right. Wait, what, okay. Michelle? Let's go! <laughs> we move What's for up? the Today Show. How are you? You ladies look gorgeous. Where's the metal detector? I didn't know it was a gun show. Okay, Michelle Obama <laughs> arms at a luncheon. You better get it. Michelle I thought Obama's it was February. I thought we were wearing sleeves and having mashed potatoes. You guys are shaving? Of course you are. Gorgeous. <laughs> you make us laugh. Wait, we Michelle, miss you. we love you. Can you, since you're weighing in on our fashion choices, do you mind weighing in on our Tuesday outfits that they selected for us? Did you see those? <laughs> <laughs> I did. You know, I love comfort. <laughs> Which one I would for go me? With B. I B? Would go with B. B. I love it. I love a sweater dress moment. Okay. What okay. About for me. Okay. What, what about, about for Jenna? For me? Don't say. Oh, what? we're really leading into the comfort. Okay. <laughs> I love A. Is that a boyfriend blazer? Who is she? <laughs> She's window shopping and getting coffee. I don't know who that is. I want to see it though. Okay. Right. Michelle, we, we love you we so love much. You. Can we talk about the movie? I mean, look at that one scene there. We got Owen Wilson, we got J Lo, Sarah Silverman, <laughs> and who but you to steal the scene as usual. Are you still going like, how did this happen? Yes, all the time. I, even watching that tease, I'm like, who is that? She's funny. It's me. You know, it's it, it's really like an out of body experience. Um, that was me pretending not to know J Lo's birthday is the same as mine. LOL. I love you. Um, you know, when we're in the scene, it's so fun. We're all vibing. We're improving. We're hitting our marks, doing our thing. I'm like, oh, this is so fun. I'm working with really great people. And then we sit down and have like a little kiki in between setups. You know, the next. Set up for the movie, and uh, then I'm realizing, oh, I'm sitting with legends. Like, uh -huh. yeah, this Gary Marshall thing, and oh, and the Super Bowl thing. And I'm like, I had a turkey burger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Michelle, it's fun. Okay, this movie is kind of a wild premise, yeah, right? J-Lo gets left at the altar, or gets cheated on, so she finds a random dude to marry. We heard that your love story with your husband was also equally as wild. Did Hello. you follow him to Europe or something? Is that true? Yes, you make me sound like a stalker, but listen, <laughs> I know, I know what I want in life. And I knew we had a connection, you know, um, and I thought, I don't know how to say his name, but I have to see him again. And when I went to Holland to go see him, hey, couldn't find a picture with a shirt on, baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> Enjoy your coffee, everybody. It's true love. What can I say? No. But um, I brought one of my best guy friends with me to Holland to go, uh, you know, check him out to let me know, am I boy crazy or is he the one? And my friend Rashim, I love him so much. He was like, this guy's a great guy. And I'm like, let's go figure out how to say his name. So I love you, guys. <laughs> now, you've got, now you've got two kids. How old are your kids? <sighs> they are three nagers. I have three-year-old oh, toddlers, oh. Hazel and Otis. Yes, come on, Halloween theme. Let's go. Come <laughs> on, Soho Cool Mom. Super tired. Let's do it. Let's Super go to the playground tired. with the wipes. Yes. So, you know, we want to have a birthday party. Obviously, it's yeah, COVID, but I'm still acting like it's a big party and got the whole balloon arch. Um, they're great. Um, they are smart. <laughs> Um, they know how to open things now <laughs> and play them strings. They know how to cry on demand. I'm like, let's get you an acting coach. You are doing it. They're great. I'm just going to keep saying it. Do can, I look okay? You look. <laughs> by the way, can we also just tell you congratulations. Your yeah. memoir is being made into a show. Netflix, baby. Yay. This is a survival of, of the, the thickest. Th yes. Incredible. That's right. Plus size essays in a small minded world. Don't worry about it. It's available on um, paperback today. Since it's the first day of Black History Month, I'm calling it a paper black moment. <laughs> Honey. And uh, I didn't get to do a book event um, or a book tour. So I'm having a little event tonight at Symphony Space on the Upper West Side of New York City. If you want to come, do it. I'll have a new outfit on, but they're both going back because I ain't got it like that. Okay. And, you know, um, when Netflix decided to option this book, and say, let's see what we can do. Um, I was I was more excited about that than my wedding. Don't tell Chais. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, 
it, it's so much more than just being funny and, and sincere, right? It is making people feel seen. It's about being sex positive, body positive, and um, also diverse. Mm-hmm. So many times when we see shows in New York City, I'm like, where's the Puerto Rican friend? Where's the Asian neighborhood? So we're going to get into all of that. And this is a true love letter to New York mm-hmm. and, um, and my life. And I named the character after my grandma, Mavis, oh. um, because she was my shining light. And, um, oh, God, don't make me cry. These are fake lashes. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. We love you, Michelle. We talk about you all the we time. Do. I didn't think we could love you anymore, but, but it, we it do. It just happened again. Michelle, look, we love you. Congratulations look, on I everything. I would love to give a shout-out to my friend Jessica. Um, <laughs> she turned 40 today. Her husband is working. She's taking care of her kids. Hi, She's Jessica. an amazing woman. She's in the book. In fact, um, she was one of the friends who was like, you know, I was trying to get breast milk for my twins with surrogate being born. And she was like, I'm still breastfeeding. And she brought over breast milk for six months and, wow. and breakfast to feed me. That's a and good this is friend. what I'm talking about. Chosen family, people in your village. Jessica, I Jessica, love you so I much. I love you too, Jessica. Jessica. Yes. And Michelle is a star, y'all. Yeah. She's in Marry Me. It's in theaters and streaming on Peacock February 11th. On no a scale of what. one to ten, how much, how hard does she make you laugh? Okay. Michelle Bateau is eleven. She's a twelve. Yeah, oh. One and <laughs> fourteen. Okay. Eighteen. All right, we call her twenty. And, she's amazing. Um, she's oh my funny. god, I love her. I know. And you're also in Marry Me. Oh, oh here with that You're a star. Honestly, can I have your autograph? She has a huge role in Marry Me, and there's some secrets behind it that maybe we'll share. <gasps> We're Later. gonna have to tune in to find Later. out. Now, we do say this every day, but you really do want to be with us tomorrow on Today. Craig has a big exclusive live in Washington. He will reveal for the first time ever the new name for the Washington football team. Can't wait to find out what that is. We'll have a great day. Guess we'll see you tomorrow. Take this and pound them nice and flat. Not too hard. Over here. Over here. Welcome to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. Today I'm dishing up the sneaky secrets I use to remake two classic chicken recipes. We've got chicken noodle soup and chicken parm. I mean, what's the point of sharing recipes if we don't dish on our secrets, right? Chicken is obviously one of the most versatile proteins out there, and it's something everyone in my family loves, frankly. So I'm always thinking of different ways to use it. So it really depends on what I'm making, but I'm a big fan of using rotisserie chicken wherever I can, especially in something like a a chicken soup. Um, I do tend to keep some frozen chicken on hand uh, because you never know when you, you need a last minute meal. But my trick is when you start to thaw the chicken, I like to begin to cut it before it's totally thawed. I find it's a lot easier to cut through when it's almost half frozen. And if it is totally thawed, my other trick is to use kitchen shears. Just use straight up scissors to cut the chicken up into little bits if if that's what you're doing. Because sometimes trying to cut fresh chicken is just so difficult. First up, chicken noodle soup with my secret ingredient. Take a look. Let's start with some carrots. Wait, these aren't carrots. What are these? Celery. Thinking. 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 Go picking. Go picking. Why are you saying picking? Peel, peel. I'm ready to peel. All right, let's peel the carrots. You literally peel better than your father. You want to cut this? No, no, no. You want to run away? Want me to tell you when I'm done? Yeah. Cal, are you going to stay for the onion? Okay. 
Can we continue? <laughs> Can I go saute the vegetables now? Chicken, take this skin off. Yeah, take the skin off. There's nudity in there. <laughs> so instead of taking the time to boil up a whole chicken, uh -huh. I just bought a pre cooked chicken at the grocery store. And some bite sized pieces, small enough for Ollie to eat. Okay, perfect. And here's my secret a noodle. ramen noodles. So when I was in Korea with the flu, I ate chicken noodle soup every single day and the noodles they used were ramen noodles and it was the best chicken soup I've ever had. So I tried to recreate that. So now I add ramen noodles to my soup. A chunk. Thank you. Not the big chunk, right. Sometimes you even like to eat these before they're cooked. It's up to you if you want to use the spice packet. Sometimes I'll use a little bit because it adds a nice little saltiness, but sometimes it doesn't need it. Put a lid on and let this simmer till dinner time. Mm. Mm. It, it looks like butter. <laughs> it does look like butter. All right, ready? Here you go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. All right, cutting onions has been the biggest obstacle that Calvin and I encounter when we are cooking together. I'll, I'll, I'll do the onions, okay? Yeah. Have no fear because you guys have written in so many wonderful suggestions and I'm gonna give them a try. Here's the thing though, the reason I never cry when Calvin is like, you know, bawling his eyes out over these onions, I wear contacts. So I think that kind of protects my eyes from whatever juices are floating around from these onions. So chances are you're not gonna see me cry because, because of my contacts, but these make sense to me. The first one is you wanna keep a bowl of water near you when you're chopping an onion. And I think that is because when you cut the onion, the acids are released into the air and water actually attracts those acids. So when you're cutting, instead of them, you know, being drawn to the water in your eye, they're being drawn to the water in the bowl itself. So that makes sense to me. I will certainly try that one. Um, another one, which I think is along the same lines, is you take a, a paper towel and you soak it in water and then you chop the onion right onto the paper towel, which also makes sense because if the acids are attracted to the water, then the water in the paper towel would draw out the acids. However, I feel like if you have a really sharp knife and you cut a little bit of paper towel, I'd rather tear up a little bit than have paper towel in my food, but that's just me. <laughs> Another one we've actually tried um, because someone sent us a pair of these onion goggles. I think it must work the same way as it does with my contacts, you know? So you put on these onion goggles. It's got a nice like, you know, a nice little seal around it. So again, these acids, whatever juices are floating around after you cut, it, cut into an onion are not getting into your eye. And how cool do they look? They need to make kids version of onion goggles because the goggles I have for Calvin are too big for his face. So not only was he trying to cut the onion, but then he's touching his face with onion juice on his fingers. So it didn't necessarily work as well. Um, he just needs glasses that fit better. Okay, and the last one is you chew a piece of gum, which you wanna wait until right before you start cutting because you'll notice when you put a piece of gum in your mouth, you naturally start talking and breathing, you know, through your mouth as opposed to breathing through your nose. So none of these onion juices are getting into your nasal cavity. And it's not making you upset. Although this is going to make my mother very upset that I'm talking with a mouthful of gum. So thank you guys so much for sending in all these tips. I love to actually get a chance to set up my science experiments and try what you recommend. I really do read through everything you suggest and um, we are certainly going to try these in the kitchen. I think the bowl of water might be our, our first try. Coming up next, my take on an Italian classic, chicken parm. And this one also has a secret ingredient. Stay tuned and I'll tell you what it is.
This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. Tonight, the major announcement of the COVID vaccine. And this is a significant moment. Your news, whenever it happens, wherever you are, it's here now. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The the no stage, which is he superhuman? Cuba magic every day. She is a superstar. Uh, Kayla, we are cheering you on. And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today. 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 Today is where the games begin. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Sunday Sit Down with Willie Geist podcast. It's the conversations you want to have with the people you'd love to meet. Get your money's worth. Unedited, unfiltered. See ya. Sit down with Willie and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. Up next is my chicken parm with a secret ingredient. It may seem a little unconventional, but instead of breadcrumbs, I actually use saltine crackers. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but I promise it works. In addition to the crackers, for this recipe, you'll need chicken, of course, Parmesan cheese, garlic powder, Italian seasoning, salt, pepper, eggs, flour, and deli mozzarella cheese. First, we're gonna prep the chicken, okay? What I need you to do is take this and pound them nice and flat. Not too hard. Over here, over here. <laughs> so let's make our breading. Here's the secret. What are these? Crackers. <gasps> we're gonna use uh -huh. saltines. Mm. So before I put the crackers in the food processor, I want to use a little bit of Parmesan cheese. I'm going to put in the breading. Pulse it. I should probably plug it in, huh? All right. All right, put all these in there. I'm going to sprinkle in some garlic powder. I'm going to add a little bit of Italian seasoning. Let's put a little in, okay? Yeah, use too much. It's just seasonings and just a little extra salt, but we don't need much salt because of the saltines. Yeah, what do you think? You can taste it. Taste it again and tell me all the flavors you taste. Cheese, garlic. What else? Seasoning. <laughs> okay. What are you doing to it? Scrambling it. Some garlic. Some pepper. Yes. And what's this for? This helps the breading stick on. Alright, last one. 
we're going to fry up our chicken cutlets. Come on over here. Let's put them on like medium, medium low. Oh, I thought you were eating a chicken. How's the cheese? They're getting there, yeah. We're working busy. We're working really busy. Okay, so let's put this here. We're gonna add deli mozzarella cheese, not fresh mozzarella, because it ends up being too watery. So now we're gonna pop this under the broiler until it's nice and bubbly. <gasps> we're done. Yay! Okay. Should we have one more bite? Mm -mm. You love it? Mmm. All right, let's take a couple questions from social media. Jenny asked, do you serve it with basil leaves or is that fresh spinach? <laughs> That's a good question. I never really explained that part of the dish. So another secret I have, I like to take my dish, I put fresh spinach in the bottom of the dish and then I drizzle it with some olive oil, some salt and fresh cracked pepper. Then I take the pasta right out of the water and let it drip just a little bit, but then I put the warm pasta on top of the spinach so it starts to kind of wilt a little bit. So it's, it's cooked, but not really cooked. And it still has that nice crunch and that fresh flavor. And all that is kind of the bed for the, the regular chicken parm. Another question we got from Instagram, do you feed the cameraman? <laughs> That's a very good question. Why do you think I made chicken parm? So my cameraman is actually my husband, Brian. Behind the scenes, cooking with Cal, and my AD on the shoot is sitting right behind me. And that's how we have to bribe him with food. with food to keep him quiet. He shoots and edits all of these, these cooking with cows for me, so it's truly a family affair. Brian. Brian's favorite meal is chicken parm, so um, this, this meal was all for him. And Caroline asks, where do we find all these recipes? Very good question. For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. Three. Let's see how fast I could cut these. No, that's terrible. <laughs> I'm Billy James, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. My name is Isabella and I'm in second grade and I'm seven years old. When I first started to cook, I was four years old and the first thing I ever made was scrambled eggs. My mom taught me how to cook. Some of my favorite making dishes are that I make with my mom are cow foot, brown stew chicken, curry goat, curry chicken. Cow foot is a is a Jamaican dish that, that my mom makes that I absolutely love. I think Grammy Pearl used to make cow foot. My great-great-grandma had a restaurant in Jamaica. Everyone in my family loves to cook, so that's why I like to cook for everyone in my family. I have my own lemonade business, and it's called Sunshine Lemonade. Some of the things I like to do are to play Roblox with my friends, playing outside in the treehouse with my sister. Well, anything to get out to have fun, really. I'm also a Girl Scout and I love to ride my bike. Today, I'm so excited because today we will be making my upside down pineapple cake and my sunshine lemonade. What I love most about it is it's not too sugary. And we also put applesauce instead of eggs for people who are vegan. This is what you need to get started. Some cooking spray, some coconut oil, brown sugar, pineapple slices, and maraschino cherries. I think maraschino cherries is a funny name. I think it might be French. <laughs> You're going to need a nine inch pan, some parchment paper, then you're going to put it at the bottom of the pan. Now you wanna spray the sides with some 
cooking spray. Now, what you are going to want to do is you're going to get your coconut oil. Pour it at the bottom. But make sure it is melted coconut oil so the cake can come out nice and moist. Now we are going to get our brown sugar. Pinch and sprinkle the coconut oil and the sugar. It's gonna make a nice caramel taste when it's done. Yep, you have to use the whole thing. We want something really sweet today. We want something really sweet today. No more vegetables. No more vegetables. Today we deserve a treat. Now you are going to want to grab the pineapple, put it in the center. And I'm going to make a flower design. And then, now I'm gonna put another pineapple right there. Pineapple right there. Whew. Okay. And then, I'm going to put it right there. And it's cherry time. Mm -hmm. Okay, one cherry, two cherry, three cherry, four cherry, five cherry, six cherry, seven cherries more. <laughs> the reason why we put the pineapples and cherries on the bottom is because the bottom is the top. So when you flip it, it looks like a cake. And now we are going to make the cake batter that right there. Cake batter time! Now we are going to preheat the oven to 350 degrees. Now I've set up all my cake batter ingredients. Now we are going to start with all our dry ingredients and then mix them together. First we are going to start with our baking powder. You have to make sure all that gets in there. Hey, you're hiding from my yarn, sir. Now the salt. Hmm, maybe I'll take some. That's better. Now, my favorite part. Be sure to take coconut. It's time for our sugar. Let's mix it well so it can combine. Now we're gonna mix up our wet ingredients. Okay, first we are going to start with some coconut oil. This might look very weird, but I promise you it's gonna look better when it's um cooked. Well, it's Open the vanilla up. Okay, got it. Make sure it's one tablespoon. This should be good. Okay. Oh! Oh no, cut, cut. Okay, we'll put some more back in there. Okay. And all goes in there. It's not that bad of a deal. It's just gonna be a little bit of vanilla. It's okay. It's okay. Who doesn't like some vanilla? Okay. Now it's time. For the pineapple juice. Oh my goodness, this is very chunky coconut milk. Last but not least, our apple cider vinegar. Now, mix well to, to combine. The coconut oil and the applesauce are gonna make the cake nice and moist. Now it's time to mix the wet ingredients with the dry ingredients. Let's grab our handy dandy whiskity whiskity. Oh my, this is very thick. Oh my. Now it's time to put the cake batter in the cake pan. This is kind of having a sad part, but now we have to put it in the oven and it takes a whole entire hour. So, I think I'm gonna have to call mom. Mom, can you help me? So the cake is in the oven and it's gonna take an hour. So in the meanwhile, how about we work on my spicy Jamaican lemonade? Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day.
make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I believe, I believe. Every dream, every journey, every triumph. And it all starts here. Let the celebration begin! The excitement is in the air. The United States wins the most the superhuman? Viewable magic every day. She is a superstar. <laughs> Kayla, we are cheering you yeah. on. And share every moment with us at the Winter Olympics. Today, 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 today is where the games begin. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? This cake goes great with my spicy Jamaican sunshine lemonade. Let me go grab the ingredients and let me show you how to make it. I need eight lemons. One, two, three. Oops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, this is just getting ridiculous. <laughs> so what you're going to need is lemons, fresh turmeric, fresh ginger root, some brown sugar, and molasses, and water too. So let's start peeling. I like to use a spoon to peel the turmeric and ginger sometimes. It's really easy. More mess, more mess, I demand more mess. Turmeric can stain your hands, so sometimes you might want to use gloves so you don't get a stain. Now, let's start peeling some ginger. You could also use ground turmeric and ginger. I like using fresh spices because it gives a better flavor. Now I have to slice these, but it's a little hard for me. So, Mom! Here's the next piece. When you're done. Okay, thanks. Uh, now I'm gonna add some water to the ginger and the turmeric and put it to a boil. Now let's start cutting up these lemons. You want to be really careful to make sure you don't cut where your fingers are because we're not cutting off fingers today, okay? Okay, well we're gonna get the lemon squeezer. Starting, yo! I love this machine because it has little holes in it, so the seeds won't go through me. When Bella squeezes lemon, she don't play. So the ginger and turmeric looks so good, it smells amazing in here. But now it's time to remove it from the stove. Okay, now I'm gonna add sugar, the molasses, and the lemon juice. But I wanna do it while it's hot, so then it can all dissolve and come together. So first, let's start with some sugar. I don't want to splash it. How about we use a spoon? That'll make life more easy right now. 
that's, do you see how satisfying that is? Now it's time for the molasses. It's so sticky. One time I tried it, it tastes a lot like honey, so I kind of liked it. Time for the lemon juice. We're going to let it cool for a bit. Okay. Put that right on top of there. This is my most favorite lemonade ever. It looks delicious. Right there. Oh my god. Ooh. This right here could make us some money, 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 money. You know what goes great with lemonade? My cake. I think it's finally ready. Let's flip it. Now you have to let it sit for 15 minutes. It's gonna be the longest 15 minutes of my life. Oop. Oh my goodness, that's exactly what we want. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Oh, wow. It looks so good. This I will eat in one bite. <gasps> now that my cake and my lemonade are ready, I'm so excited to share this with my favorite person, my mom. Thank you. It looks, I know, it looks so good. Mm. Mm, super moist. Mm. There it go. Thank you. Delicious. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. I loved you guys being in my kitchen with me today. Hopefully, you can make this recipe too. See you later. Bye. Another massive winter storm set to race across the country. Nearly 80 million people in its path stretching 2,000 miles from Colorado all the way.